Hey guys, my name is Shashank Kalamathy, and you're here joining me on the first video in a series of videos that I'm creating to go over the book Hands-On Machine Learning with Scikit-Learn and TensorFlow by Aurelian Garone. This book is considered kind of the, um, like the, the book that everyone recommends that you uh, start off with when you're learning machine learning. And I'm going to go through this book chapter by chapter and walk you guys through it and um, do what I feel like is a vast simplification of the book to make it easier for you to pick up. Um, so we're going to actually start off with chapter two today because chapter one is pretty self-explanatory. Um, it's really just like some background information. So you can go ahead and read that and, you know, um, get, get as much, uh, get whatever information you need to, um, off of it. I'll probably create some notes and release something later on it, but I really wanted to get started with some real content today. And that's why we're starting off with chapter two. Um, so chapter two over here is a full machine learning project from start to finish. And uh, I'll be explaining all the steps that we go through, what we're doing, why we're doing it, and um, vastly simplify what I uh, uh, what what Mr. Garone did in his book because um, I think it is incredibly detailed. Um, sometimes a little bit too detailed for what you really need to know. So I took out, I stripped out a lot of the detail in order to like really get you to results. That's what I'm focusing on over here. So. Um, I would recommend that you either know Python to a pretty uh, solid level before embarking on this journey with me, or you can go ahead and take my free Python course in my, um, uh, in my YouTube channel, which I have linked above over here, I think. And if you watch that video and you understand what's going on over there, then you should, be, you should have no problems with the Python, because I'm not going to focus too much on the Python language itself, because it is, uh, it'll be a distraction for learning all these other complicated things that we need to uh, uh, learn. Machine learning is not an easy thing to pick up, so if Python syntax is really getting in your way, then I would highly recommend going over that and reviewing that first before you go ahead and do this. There's also another set of courses from Kaggle, which are tremendous and awesome for this exact, um, for the knowledge that you need in order to get to a solid level of understanding for here. Additionally, if you're interested in getting the book, I have an Amazon affiliate link in the description below that you can go ahead and click on. Um, the price should be the exact same as if you were to order it yourself on any on, on a normal Amazon website, except I receive a small commission for it. Um, so it, it, it doesn't uh, negatively affect you in any way uh, and benefits me and shows me that you uh, are interested in supporting my work. Also, speaking of supporting my work, uh, I am going to be go putting all of my content on this YouTube video, but if you would like a copy of the written notes and the GitHub that go with this uh, video and with this series, please try and support me on Patreon. I tried to price the uh, Patreon at something that anyone could afford, um, and the value that I feel you'll be getting from this is you can totally copy all the code from this video as I'm typing it 100%. But I'll have um, some more detailed explanations, and I'll have typed up all the code for you. So you'll just have to like look through it, and you can print it out on a PDF and look through it. And uh, there are checklists and everything for you to look through. And unlike a lot of Patreons, um, as I make more content, I'll be adding more content onto it. So if you're interested, please feel free to check that out. Uh, and without further ado, let's get started. All right, so moving to the computer, let us see. Yes, okay, so we are starting with chapter, whoops, chapter two. Again, these notes will be, uh, you'll see the entirety of the notes in this video, so if you wanna like, you know, handwrite them yourself, um, but you can get a copy of them yourself if you join my Patreon. So the chapter starts off by basically saying you are, the situation is you are a um, data scientist working at a company that is trying to use uh, a bunch of tabular data that they have in order to predict the median price of homes in various parts of California. And using this tabular data, we're gonna perform some transformations and we're gonna uh, apply some machine learning algorithms and go through the process start to finish in order to get you, uh, in order to predict the median value of um, homes in uh, using the information in this data set. It's a very good problem. It's uh, the data set is um, a solid data set, pretty clean, but not clean enough to where there's no work for us to do. So. Garone provides a tremendous machine learning checklist in the back of this book, uh, Appendix B, I believe. So what happens is you, I actually put the entire appendix in this easy to use format over here in Notion. That way you can um, see the upper levels of like what needs to get done. First of all, you need to frame, like what's the machine learning checklist? You first need to frame your problem and look at the big picture, always important. Get the data, explore the data, prepare the data, shortlist promising models, fine tune the system, uh, present your solution and launch. We're going to be going through most of these steps today. Of course, we're not going to be presenting our solution or really launching today. Um, 
but we will be framing the problem, getting the data, exploring the data, preparing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and this is the same checklist that's in his workbook, just you know, in a in a format that's easy to copy and easy to print out on your own. So you can even click on this button over here, and then expand all of these, and then hit Command P or Control P, and then print it out as a PDF. So that might be beneficial for you if you're uh, interested in doing that. So we're going to be focusing on using the end-to-end -end, uh, machine learning checklist, and we're going to uh, first of all we need to frame the problem. Uh, he mentioned something called a pipeline in his uh, book, and what a pipeline is is it's basically a, uh, a piece of software, or it's all called a data processing pipeline. It's either a piece of software or a bunch of code that takes data in on one end and spits out a an output that looks different on the other end. Uh, and there are many different types of data processing pipelines. You have things like Dell Boomi, which is an ETL tool, extract, transform, load. That's just a process of extracting data, transforming it, and then loading it into a database. Um, or uh, parts of Azure Data Factory, and like all the cloud services now have their own like data factory thing that lets you like easily manipulate your data. Um, so we're going to be creating our own machine learning pipelines. That way we can uh, easily change the data sets if we need to and take in future data if we need to. So in this, um, as part of the checklist, one of the first questions you have to ask yourself is, what is the current solution? So you'll see under here, under frame the problem, um, there is, what is the current solution? Ah, what, uh, number three, what are the current solutions slash workarounds, if any? Um, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about the problem itself. I think that the code is going to teach you the most over here. But basically, there are um, the, a team of experts use something called a rules engine um, and their domain knowledge in order to predict the prices of houses. Uh, and what a rules engine is, is it's basically just um, a, I wouldn't call it a, it's not really a black box. It's, it's a uh, piece of software or code where you insert uh, some data into it, and using some rules, it'll either classify the data as like this or that. Um, and it is very different from uh, reg uh, from machine learning. It's kind of the exact opposite of machine learning, where um, uh, it, it's just a series of steps that data follows to get to an end output. Whereas machine learning, we're telling the machine to tell to learn the patterns itself instead of us telling it what patterns exist in the data, and then uh, to uh, output whatever output we've already predefined. Next, we have to ask ourselves, what type of problem is this? So first, define the number of output variables, univariate, bivariate, multivariate. Um, so one variable, two variables, or many variables. Um, the machine learning paradigm, and then the type of problem. So this is because what we're trying to do is we're trying to take a data set um, where, and let me actually open up the data set for you guys. I feel like that might be a little bit useful. So you'll see the data set over here has a longitude, a latitude, um, a bunch of different uh, characteristics, and then median house value. So we're actually interested in using all of the columns except for median house value to predict the median house value. And because we're trying to predict only one variable, this is going to be called a univariate problem. The paradigm, uh, you have three basic paradigms in machine learning. You have supervised models, unsupervised models, and reinforcement learning models. Um, we're going to be focusing on supervised models this time, where basically what that means is we provide it the um, uh, variables to, uh, to use to predict and what value it should get. In this situation, because we know what the median house value is, we are, we are giving it um, uh, the variables over here and then it needs to predict a value that we already give it, uh, and then use that to make predictions in the future that we don't give it. So this is a supervised machine learning algorithm. In an unsupervised algorithm, what happens is you basically throw a machine learning algorithm at a data set and say, hey, discover some patterns for me, make some groups for me. That's unsupervised, where you don't have a target variable, basically. Uh, and then reinforcement learning is something that is um, completely beyond the scope of this problem, but it's basically you give a machine learning algorithm uh, punishments and rewards towards a certain goal that you want it to achieve. So that's what that is. Uh, let's see. Ah, the answer. Yeah, so this will be a, a supervised univariate regression task. Um, oh, and then uh, under supervised, you have a regression. Um, the types of problems are either regression or classification. Regressions just mean you're trying to predict a value Classification just means you're trying to predict a, um, a class. So for example, if you see over here, because we want to predict median house value, we are predicting a value. We're not predicting a class. 
So that's very important to know too, because the code you will use is fundamentally different, or not fundamentally, but it's quite different between uh, regression and classification tasks. Next, we need to select a performance measure. How are we actually going to um, check the performance of our model? Um, I think we, uh, in the book, he settles on root mean squared error. Um, and here are the different types of, whoops, here are the different performance measures you can use for a regression task. Um, and you can see that, for example, um, mean absolute error does not penalize large errors versus root mean squared error does. And depending on what the desired accuracy is of your um, regressor or your machine learning model, you might want to pick one or the other. So we're going to go with root mean squared error. And if you hear some terms that I don't go too in depth into, it's totally 100% fine. The reason I'm doing that is because chapter two of the book is purely about going through a machine learning problem from start to finish. It's not about getting too in depth into it, but it's basically to give you a wide overview of what a machine learning practitioner actually does. And this is something that I think Aurelian Garone in his book is a little bit, um, uh, goes into too much detail to really like communicate effectively sometimes. Um, he shows you so many things in this chapter, many of which I will be skipping because it, it, it distracts from the main purpose, which is like, okay, overall, how does an average machine learning problem look like? And that's what we're really going to be focusing on over here. So the first thing we need to do is get our data and prepare our environment. So if you don't have Anaconda or Miniconda, or you don't know how to set up environments, go to my Python tutorial, again, linked up over here, um, and look at, I believe it was, oh, it's right here, yes. Go look at um, five minutes and 24 seconds until 15 minutes and 10 seconds on my Python tutorial. If, if I don't link it over here, then it's on my YouTube channel. It's very easy to find. Uh, and it will get your computer set up with Python and everything. So make sure you do that first. I'm not going to go over those steps again um, because I've already created the resource for you guys to do that completely, completely free. So assuming that you've gone ahead and done that, let us go to our terminal if you're on Mac or open up Anaconda prompt if you're on Windows. Um, and I use Miniconda just because I prefer to work in command line for this kind of stuff. So you'll see that I'm in the base environment. Um, so let us go ahead and create a new environment. So we type in conda create dash dash name and we'll call this um, hands on machine learning. So H O M L. So in fact, we'll call it hands underscore on ML. That way it's a little bit more specific. And hit enter. Oh, and then let me zoom in for you guys. So I just typed in conda create, uh, and then typed in Y, conda create hands on ML. Uh, where is it? This right over here. So let's go ahead and let's even put this in our notes actually. And these notes are a living document. They'll keep improving and improving as time goes on. Um, and remember, on the Patreon, you'll keep getting more and more. Like, the $5 a month is uh, for me to continuously create content for you guys. Um, this stuff takes a lot of time out of my day in order to create. I love creating it for you guys. Um, but this would really help me, uh, help me out if you're able to support. If not, totally fine. All the information you need is still in this video. Don't worry about it. All right, so now that we've created our environment, let us go and uh, activate it. So conda activate, uh, what do we call it? Hands underscore on underscore ML. And what we did over here is we basically created an environment, which is a isolated um, piece. Uh, it's an isolated kind of folder in your computer where you have a separate installation of Python going on. And the reason that we want this is that eventually when you start installing more and more complex libraries, different libraries will not play nicely with different versions of other libraries, which is why you want to keep everything as separated by project as possible. Um, and that's what I do. So for this hands-on machine learning project, we're going to have one live or one environment that we'll use for the entire thing, if possible. Uh, they may ask us to make multiple environments, but we'll just use the one. All right, so now that we have hands-on ML, uh, let us go and install scikit-learn. So scikit-learn and this is, I'm teaching you guys how to like also like look up how to like install libraries on Conda because you, if you use a pip package manager, um, the codes to install things are different than in scikit-learn. So we'll type in Conda sklearn. And scikit-learn is just the standard machine learning library inside Python. So you'll see this is the standard website for sklearn. Under operating system, we're going to click on Mac OS. Uh, of course, if you're on Windows, click Windows. And then packager, we'll click 
click conda. And I'm just going to copy this code over here. Hit enter. And it'll go ahead and install scikit-learn for me. I believe the only thing I need is scikit-learn because it'll install pandas and everything else with it. All right, go ahead and put that in there. This might take a Hands-on ML, there we go. If anyone knows a better way to do that, let me know. Um, usually I just quit once or twice and it'll show up eventually. All right, so now we're in the hands-on ML uh, library that we created earlier. So let's get started with our, with our imports like we always do. Um, first of all, let's create a markdown cell and type in hash chapter two. And then I'll explain the overall structure of what we want to do and then get into the code in a minute. Or sorry, let me get into the code and then explain the overall structure of what we're doing. So let's do import, our normal import statement. So pandas as pd. My god. And then import os. Uh, oh, okay. And then, yeah, I forgot to install ipykernel. So let's just let it install ipykernel. As you can see, it's installing matplotlib inline and IPython. Uh, speaking of which, we need to install matplotlib. So let us actually do that right now while we're here. So conda install matplotlib. There we go. And then I believe that should be it. All right, so now that we have import pandas as PD and import OS in there, let us um, open up our data set. And we're going to do that first by defining our file path. So I always like to do PWD, which means present working directory, equals os.get current working directory. And then uh, this is actually a trick I learned from one of our uh, viewers. Let's see, we'll call file path equals... Um, os.path.join, I think. And I'm going to join present working directory and housing.csv. And I just hit uh, shift enter in order to see, uh, in order to execute that cell. So we brought in the present working directory, which um, helped uh, tell the Python notebook to go look and like define, okay, where are you right now? Go find yourself first. And then uh, I added housing.csv. And the reason we want to do os.path.join instead of just like adding uh, like two strings together is this is os agnostic. Because if you're on Windows, you will actually see double backslashes over here. Um, because Windows uses a backslash, and a backslash is actually the escape character in Python, meaning that it's what you use whenever you want to define some special command in a string. Um, Windows, for whatever reason, uses backslashes, but Unix operating systems like Mac, uh, Mac OS, use a forward slash. So long story short, you want to use os.path.join in order to create a file path that you can just share with your Windows or your Mac friends that will automatically convert itself into the appropriate format for your operating system. So now that we have that, let's go ahead and bring in our data set. So we're going to call this housing underscore data equals pd, meaning pandas. We're referring to the pandas up here. So pd dot read underscore csv and that file path we just defined. And then I'm going to type in housing data over here in order to get a preview. So you can, in, um, with Python notebooks, the great thing is you can always uh, just type in whatever you want to look at um, on the last line and it'll give you a preview of that and usually a nice looking preview too. Um, if I, for example, used the, a print statement like you might normally do, uh, you'll see it'll, it'll look a lot uglier, this data frame. See? So you don't want to, you don't want to do that. You want to do... I'm just curious, I think. There was something called pretty print, I think, but it doesn't matter. So here's that same data set I showed you guys earlier. So we have all of our data over here. So let's get started. So. The first thing you want to do whenever you look at a, when you're starting a machine learning project, let's go back to our checklist. So we, we got that, so we framed the problem. Um, I didn't spend too much time on that because for the sake of um, uh, 
this lecture is not really important. Um, there's a problem. Go solve it. We got the data. So normally um, in, in his book, he has this way of like getting the data from the internet and everything. Um, I just give you the data in the GitHub uh, GitHub repository, and I'll make that accessible to everyone. That way anyone, anyone can follow along if they want to. Um, and then uh, we need to explore the data. So what does exploring the data do? Exploring the data is where we go and we deep dive into the data. We do uh, we run our um, statistical tests on it and or we calculate the measures of central tendency, your means, medians, modes, and ranges. Um, we visualize the data and we run histograms on the data in order to get a better understanding of what we're actually looking at and trying to see what patterns we might actually get, get out of the data. After we um, explore our data, we are then going to prepare our data. And this is probably where we're going to spend the most time and where if you've read anything about machine learning, you'll know that data scientists spend most of their time uh, pre-processing their data because it almost is never available and as easy to use as uh, a perfect the kind of data set you need in order to run a machine learning algorithm. Then we're going to combine shortlist and fine-tune the system. Uh, and then we're going to spend the rest of the video shortlisting promising models, uh, fine-tuning the system, and uh, that'll take less time. So I think of what we're going to do right now, exploring the data will take about maybe 10 to 20% of our time. Uh, preparing the data will take 70 to 80% of our time. And the other 10 to 20% will be um, fine-tuning the, like actually running models and stuff. So let's get back to it. So let's go ahead and take a quick look at our data. So what we can do is we can always type in on the next cell, housing underscore data dot info, and then use our parentheses. And you'll see we get uh, some basic uh, information on the data that we have, how many entries there are. So you'll see we have uh, 20,640 entries. And they go from column zero to, I mean, sorry, row zero to row 200 or 20,639. This is because, again, Python uses zero based indexing. This is different if you're coming from the world of R, where R uses one based indexing, uh, meaning that Python always starts off at a zero, um, except for some very annoying specific cases. Um, if you watch my Python tutorial, you'll know what I'm talking about. And then we have our different columns listed over here. So it looks like we have 10 different columns. As you see, it starts counting off at zero and ends at nine, which means we need to add a one to this number over here, 10 different columns. Um, and it looks like none of the row or none of the columns are completely null. And here are our basic data types. Float 64 basically means this is a decimal base number. Uh, and object means that this is a string. Um, there are many other data types out there actually, but we're not going to worry about that right now. Um, for example, like you'll be working with dates at one point in time and dates will be the bane of your existence because the format that dates are stored in is so computer unfriendly. Um, I mean, if you think about it, right, it's, uh, seconds and there's 60 seconds in a, in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, 60 hour, or 24 hours in a day, um, seven days in a week. Like none of this, like, it, it's not like a base 10 system, like everything else is, um, if you live in the metric world, unlike us in the U.S. So uh, dates will be the bane of your existence. That's my little spiel on that over there. Um, so we have basic info on our data set. Let us go ahead and take a quick look at this object, ocean proximity. Um, if you see over here, it says object. So if I go to the far right and I look at ocean proximity, you can see it looks like um, it is a category that tells us how close every... Um, how close the ocean is to each house that we're looking at. Um, so let's just go ahead and explore that, see what that looks like. You know, just because that's a little bit different from what, what else we have. So let's go housing data, and then we're going to select the ocean proximity column, ocean proximity. Uh, and then I think we can just type in dot, yeah, dot value counts, and then hit shift enter. And you'll see that we have one, two, three, four, five different categories. Um, and in those five categories, it looks like there are five entries that are in an island and about 2,000 each in a uh, either near a bay or an ocean, um, 10,000 or 9,000 that are like less than an hour away from an ocean and about 6,500 that are uh, inland. Um, these raw numbers are great, but you almost always want to visualize data. Visualize, visualize, visualize. You can almost never visualize data too much because there are patterns that your eyes will detect that you won't be able to understand just the numbers, the raw numbers in front of you. So let's go ahead and visualize this data. So it looks like we have a series object over here, and we can use the pandas, the pandas plot function. So plot, just attach it to the end. Okay, so it looks like it first thought of making a line graph. So how can we change this? So 
what we can actually do over here is we can type in, I think, uh, kind equals bar. Okay. Um, now, any of you that remember that book I recommended earlier, Storytelling with Data, will remember that one of the big things that book says is that horizontal bar charts are almost always better than vertical bar charts. You can understand data up to down, and you can compare values up and down more easily than you can compare values from left to right. So I'm actually going to type in bar H over here, and that means horizontal bar chart. And we have a much easier to look at chart. So I can see that, for example, there's almost no island values as we saw before. Um, but I actually couldn't, I didn't really uh, think that um, we had so many more properties close to the ocean within an hour of the ocean than uh, inland. Because um, especially if you combine it with the near ocean and the near bay, then you'll see it's quite up there. So that's just a quick uh, look at, like, you know, let's just visualize like one of the columns and see what it's like. So the good thing is it looks like this categorical column only has five values in it that we have to encode. And I'll talk about what encoding is in a little bit. So let's go ahead and run the next little thing that every data scientist runs. Uh, these first steps that I do, you should be doing them with almost every data set that you have. Um, just go ahead and like look at a column that's interesting to you, uh, because oftentimes people will go really deep into data preparation without understanding how wonky their data might actually be. Um, luckily, this data is actually quite clean, but that is almost never guaranteed. So, what I did here is I ran housing date housing underscore data dot describe, uh, and what that does is that actually gives me a bunch of statistical measures on um, all of the numerical columns, I believe. Correct, all the numerical columns in our data set. So you have the count, the mean, standard deviation, minimum, twenty fifth percentile, fiftieth and seventy fifth percentile, and the maximum value. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> We're not going to spend too much time looking at this. Um, if we were like really deep diving into this data set, then 100% uh, we would. But the whole purpose of this video is to show you guys how a machine learning project works from end to end. So you just run this, yeah, and this is just something you do in order to like get a good look at the data and everything. But we'll not worry too much about it for now. Next, we're going. What we're going to do is um, our uh, the scenario that he point uh, he paints in the book is that the um, experts that you are uh, trying to help out tell you that median income is actually a high, a very important determinant for the price of a house. Now, you know, 2 plus 2 equals 4. This is quite obvious. Um, so let what, are, what we'll do is if you see median income over here, let us go ahead and actually uh, bin those values, meaning we'll group those values into different groups um, as to reduce the amount of, like, groups we're looking at at any given time. And let me show you why. Um, so if I type in housing data dot or and then I get the median income column and I type in dot hist so you'll see that we get a nice histogram over here uh, I'm gonna try and bin these values a little bit more in order to make a make a point for you guys um, so let's go ahead and do the same housing data uh, media or in fact we're, we'll create a new column we'll call it income underscore cat meaning income category equals pd.cut. And this is kind of to also show you guys the pd.cut function. Um, the pd.cut method, um, I use method and function interchangeably. The pd.cut method will help you create bins for your values. So let's go ahead and say housing. In fact, let me actually just copy this. That way I'm not wasting all this time typing something out. Housing data median underscore income, uh, yeah, median underscore income, and then we define the bins over here and the labels, and then let's go ahead and create a chart on that using the same thing we were doing earlier. So housing data, income underscore cat, there we go. Oh, and we have to import NumPy, it looks like. Okay, so let's go ahead and import NumPy up here. as NP. So let's go ahead and import NumPy. So we'll see pandas.cut housing data and then the bins, NP.infinity, uh, INF, that just means like to infinity. Um, and, and you'll see like Python, there's a lot of like mathematical and like numerical functions that are just kind of like missing from the language. Uh, and NumPy adds a lot of that back end. So like num, like, uh, um, uh, whatever the opposite of a real number is, uh, I think they're called irrational numbers, stuff like that. That'll all be added by NumPy oftentimes. All right, looks like that. Oh, dot value counts. Okay, cool. So we have our 
five different bins over here, and you can see that um, there are X number of values in each bin. Let's go ahead and visualize that using the same method we did earlier, dot hist. Did I do that correctly? That doesn't look right. Oh, uh, you know what? Let me try this. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, I did that incorrectly. What I need to do is, so it tried to bin my bins, um, so I don't want I don't want it to do that. So income underscore cat dot hist, and you'll see we have a clean visualization over here that shows us. Okay, it looks like most people are in the middle income, uh, and then there are fewer people in the richer incomes, and there's a lot of people in the uh, uh, level two income level. So that's just a quick visualization that we can use. Um, whenever someone tells you that a certain variable is very interesting, sometimes you just want to go look at that really quickly. So uh, let us go ahead and go to the first step of preparing our data for the machine. Uh, for the visualization process, and I'll tell you why we're doing this in a minute. So first, go ahead and create a new cell, and then type in y equals housing underscore data median house value, and then use an uppercase x, that's just convention, so uppercase x equals housing underscore data uh, dot drop, meaning that we're just going to get rid of it, median house value, and I'll explain this in a second, axis equals one. So what we're doing over here is we're creating our X data set and our Y data set, basically our um, features and our labels. Um, I use the word features and machine learning practitioners use the word features interchangeably with the word columns. So Y over here are the labels we're trying to predict. So we're trying to predict, uh, if you look at this over here, are the median house value. That's what we want to predict. So we want to separate that from what we're going to actually be throwing into the machine learning algorithm, which is our X, which is everything but the median housing value. So we've separated it into two different data sets over here. We have our X and our Y, um, our, what we're trying to predict, which is the Y, and what we are going to use to predict, which is the X. And then let's go ahead and create a new markdown cell. And then let's type in hash. Um, split data set. All right. So now we're going to bring in, uh, we're going to start working with sklearn, which is uh, scikit-learn, and that's the standard machine learning library that uh, basically everything in uh, Python, in, in the Python machine learning space is based off of. I think even more advanced machine lear learning libraries will oftentimes use sklearn as a base. So from sklearn.preprocessing, I believe, import Oh no, model selection. Model underscore selection import train test split. Uh, and this is basically the standard way that you split your data into training and testing modules. Now what are we splitting our data into training and testing modules uh, for? Let's go let's just do it and I'll explain in a second. So type in x train x underscore test y underscore train y underscore test. And use capital X's because that's just convention. Um, you want to use convention as much as possible because um, other people might be reading your code, and they all, they always say code is read way more than it's more than it's written, and so it's very important that you make your code very readable. And part of doing that is using conventions whenever you can. All right. All right, so what we're doing over here, we're, we're doing something called a train test split. So what a train test split is, is it basically splits your data set um, horizontally into a training set and into a testing set. And the uh, reason that you want, so what happens like if you have 100 columns, like maybe like 33 of them will be in your testing set and the other 67 of them will be in the training set. And what you do then is you take the training set and you input that into the tests, or you input that into the machine learning model. And you have the machine learning model only look at the training set, only look at the training set, never look at the test set, and only train and train itself on that training set of data. Then what happens in order to test the accuracy of your machine learning model, you go ahead and you give it the test set. And you say, okay, you've never seen this data before, go ahead and look at it and predict the values. And the reason you want to do this is to make sure that the uh, you're not overfitting. What overfitting is, is overfitting means that your machine learning model 
doesn't look for general patterns and instead it looks at how can I best optimize for this specific data set in front of me exactly. So for example, if we were to hyper optimize that and we gave it any different data, it wouldn't know what to do with that different data and it would um, uh, give us a very bad result, which is why you always wanna have a training set and a testing set. Uh, I'll probably create a video where I explain the entire machine learning process in a little bit more detail, um, but this is how we do it in practice. So. With this data set over here, you'll see what it did is it randomized the columns. So it randomly picked columns. You can see the indexes, indices over here are all over the place. Um, it jumbled them all up, and it only gave us 13,828 rows out of like the 20,000 rows we had earlier. And I told it to give uh, a test size of 0 0.33, which means that 33% of the values are going to be in the test data set, and the other 67% will be in, in the uh, training data set. And um, this number, depending on who you ask, people will tell you you should be using different amounts. I normally use 20% in the test set and 80% in the training set, but I think Garon uses 33% in this um, instance, and he knows his data better than I do, so I'm just going with his number. Um, plus, for this problem, it's not too important. So now we've split our data into our training and testing um, sets. One thing that we want to check, um, let us do this. So let's get the original housing data, right? So housing underscore data. And like, let's look at the income cat that we had earlier. Dot hist. And let's run that. And the reason we're looking at income cat is because we were told by the people, you know, in this fictional universe that the uh, median income is very important for determining the um, average uh, median price of the house. Okay, so this is the distribution of values in the income cat column. Now let's go ahead and take our X train set, right? So X train, and you can see it looks like this. Looks exactly the same as the other one. And let's go ahead and look at the income cat on that. Income cat dot hist. And the reason I want to do this, and I need to zoom out a little bit for this, is I want to see, is the income category, that column, is the distribution of values within my training set approximately equivalent to what I have in my testing set? And the reason that's important is, say, for example, we sampled very specific values that led us to... Um, where to, that, and, and that led us to have a training set where almost everyone was high income in that training set, well, then when we give it to our machine learning model, it's going to think that everyone in the world is a high income earner, and it's going to overweight that uh, set of values in our predictions. And that's why we want to make sure that like, when we split our training and testing set, the training set has the same approximate distribution of values as the, t as the um, original set of data did. In this case, it looks like that's what's happening. But in case that doesn't happen, we can use something called a stratified split. So I'm going to add this over here. Stratified split. OK, so this code is a little bit complex. So I'm just going to copy this, paste it over here. All right, so what this does over here is this will, yes, this uses the 0 0.2 value that I like to use a lot more, where 20% uh, of your values are in your testing set and the other per 80% are in your training set. Uh, we have our train index, test index, split split, um, housing data, income cat, yes, awesome. So what this is going to do is that this is going to split our data using the income cat uh, column to make sure that the... Um, approximate percentages of each income cat are evenly distributed. So let's go ahead and run this. And you can see it's going to create something called strat train set and strat test set instead of x train and y train. So in order to check and make sure that it actually did its job correctly, because um, you, you always want to make sure your code actually does what you think it's supposed to do. Let's go ahead and bring out this uh, dot cat column. Uh, whoops dot value counts divided by the length strat test set and then let us do the same hey guys sorry unfortunately it looks like my microphone uh, just isn't working anymore so um, I hope the audio, audio quality is not too bad um, but I'm just going to be using my laptop speakers uh, or my laptop microphone from now on so Going back to what we were talking about, um, 
if I remember correctly, basically I was talking about how we want to check and make sure that the, that the code actually works the way we expect it to. So let's go ahead and type in income cat over here dot value counts uh, and then divide it by the length of the strat test split again. Or wait, wait we want to run by the length of housing data actually. And you'll see over here that it looks like for each of our categories, we're getting about the same number or same percentage of values. So what this tells us is this tells us that our um, stratified test split does exactly what it's, what we expected to do. Uh, and there should be no problems with what we, uh, for the distribution of, var of variables within the uh, income cat variable that we have the distribution of values within the income cat variable that we have. Um, in this specific situation, as you can see from these histograms over here, we didn't really have to do it, but um, it is important to remember this because this is one of those really uh, big gotchas where you can train this amazing algorithm, but because the, the actual way you split the data set was incorrect or was heavily biased towards one uh, value versus another or one distribution versus another, um, that you have to throw out the results anyways, or it doesn't perform very well in a testing data set. All right, so this over here is just a bit of code that we write. Um, that's not really important to what we're doing, but it's inside the book. And he basically writes just to compare the overall um, percentage error. And let's see, he multiplies by 100. So this is an actual percentage. So you'll see we're basically within 5% for every single category that we're in. All right, so let's go on to the next section. Um, so what we really want to do next is we want to, um, oh, and then we don't want this income category variable anymore. Uh, it doesn't really do us any good because it's basically a, um, it's it's the exact, it's just a, a binned version of another uh, variable. So we don't really want it. So all you have to do, we're going to be using the strat train set and the strat test set as our training and testing set. Uh, just type in dot drop income cat access equals columns, or you can say access equals one, I believe, and in place equals true. This will basically just drop the income cat category that we created. Uh, we don't really want that anymore. So let's go ahead and create a new markdown cell and then type in, let's see, visualizing our data. All right. And one big thing I want to uh, illustrate to show you guys how important visualizing your data is. You can run as many statistics as you want on your data and still come out with an incorrect uh, result because there are data sets where um, they can have the same mean, median, and mode between them but look completely different. And here's an example I provide in my uh, in the code that I give you guys in uh, with the Patreon. And let me just put it over here. Um, this is not at all relevant to the... Oh, uh, let's see. Also import matplotlib. So import matplotlib.pyplot as plt. And this is something called Anscombe's quartet, which is basically a quartet of data sets that have the exact same mean, median, and mode as you can see over here. But because of the way, because of the very specific way they're created, they're actually completely different sets of data, and you would never see this unless you actually visualize the data. And this is why data visualization is so important, and why uh, you must always do it whenever you're playing around with new data. Don't just trust the, the statistics. Visualize your data. So there's a couple of uh, things we can do to visualize our data. Um, let's see. Let us go to. Let's just first create a histogram. So I'm going to start labeling these, uh, and I believe I used a double hash over here. So histograms are a tremendous way to start off your visualization process, and they're very easy to do with pandas. So let's type in housing. Do I have a data set called housing? Let's see. Not yet. So where do we need to put this? Ah, OK. So one thing I should let you guys know is that in pandas, where you can, you usually want to create copies of data sets because um, if you make any mistakes, you don't want to run a bunch of code again in order to recreate your data set. So we're going to do, we're going to create a copy called housing, and we're going to say that equals strat test set dot copy. And there's a reason we're only going to be visualizing the test set of data. Sorry, this should be train. 
you want to avoid looking at your test set of data as much as possible because if um, you look at your test set of data, there is a good chance that you will start to see patterns in it yourself and that might lead you to want to train your algorithms in such a way as to um, overfit to your test set. And remember, the whole point of the test set is you want to keep it as isolated as possible from your entire machine learning process. That way you can get an honest evaluation on your machine learning model to see if it is accurate to, if the machine learning model you trained is accurate to reality. And we're using the train uh, the test set to emulate reality. So you want to look at your test set as little as possible. So that's why I'm only going to be visualizing the training set of data. Do not visualize your test set of data. You want to avoid that. All right, so now we have our housing set, uh, which remember is just the same as our, tra our training set. And what you can do is you can just type in housing.hist and Pandas will, oh, well, let's do one more thing. Let's do bins equals 50. Uh, and this is just good for the data set we're looking at right now. But you'll have to play around with it to see if that is what you're looking for. And then big size equals 20 by 15. That way we get a bigger, there we go. And you can see we have a couple of histograms over here uh, where we see a spike in a long, this longitude and this longitude over here. There's a spike in this latitude over here and over here. Uh, it looks like there's a bunch of homeowners that are uh, on the older end of the spectrum. Um, let's see what else. Total rooms. It looks like there are just some areas with a lot of rooms in them. Total bedrooms. It, this data skews to the right. Um, so wherever the tail is, that's where the skew is. It looks like there's a couple of outliers with our housing values over here. Uh, we're not going to worry too much about outliers in this project. Again, the whole idea is to sh just to show you how a machine learning project works from end to end. Uh, and it looks like our median income is right skewed and our household is right skewed. And that more or less matches reality. Um, uh, at least in the U.S., incomes tend to right skew, meaning that there are a very small number of people that have extremely high levels of wealth. Um, and most people are stuck in around this area over here. So... That's our quick little visualization over there. Let's go ahead and look at a visualization of the median income real fast. Just a histogram of that. Because remember, that's what we are, we were told was apparently a very good thing to look at. Okay, yeah. And we can always increase the number of bins if we want to. Bins equals 50. Okay, cool, cool, cool. And then let us go ahead and plot our geographic data. Um, now this over here is definitely something you'll want to copy and paste because, um, and, and, and I'll tell you guys why in a second, so. And don't worry, a lot of this visualization work I'm kind of just doing, um, whoops, this should be. And a lot of the visualization work I'm not doing too seriously right now because um, it's not really the meat and potatoes of what we're looking at. It's going to be more of the other stuff that we're doing. So you'll see over here that this is, you know, it's, it's data from California. This looks just like California for anyone familiar with it. Um, so what uh, uh, Garone in his book is trying to do is he's trying to make these plots in something called matplotlib, which is the standard plotting library inside Python. Um, Honestly, matplotlib is just not that great. Um, I don't like using it. I avoid using it whenever I can. And I prefer to use tools like Plotly. Um, now I tried Plotly with this geographic data and it looked like it was just too much data for it to plot all at once. So what I would highly, 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 highly recommend um, you or your team do is instead, if you have Windows, download Power BI or Tableau Public. Um, or if you have a Mac, download Tableau Public. And use Tableau or Power BI for your visualizations, unless you have very simple ones like um, dot .hist. Um, trying to create bespoke visualizations through matplotlib is much harder than using these other tools. And honestly, they're totally worth the price. Example. So let's go ahead and get back to, let's go ahead and get back to the task at hand. The next thing we're going to be looking at is something called a correlation matrix. Um, and what I'm doing over here is like uh, in, in the step of visualization, I just want to show you guys a, kind of a small short smorgasbord of different um, visualizations that are really good to run on any data that you have. So you always want to run your histograms on uh, the entire numerical data set. And then you want to run your uh, a histogram on the specific point that you're in, the specific calculation that you're interested in, on the specific um, predictive variable that you're interested in. And in our case, it'll be median um, house or median income. And next, we're going to be looking at correlation matrices. Uh, and what these are, these are basically... 
So if you just type in your data set dot C O R R, you'll see all the different correlations between different variables. So longitude to longitude, obviously it has a one to one correlation. Uh, but longitude to latitude, it looks like there's a negative 0.92 cor correlation. You can go from negative one to positive one. Uh, negative one's a very strong negative relationship, negative or positive one's a very strong positive relationship. And you know, this is all good and well. And this was, you know, of course, very easy to calculate. I didn't really have to do anything except add dot C O R R at the end of um, our data set. But what if we could turn this into a um, easy to look at graph? Well, that's what we're going to be doing right now using something called Seaborn. And this is a, uh, a lot of the code that I'm copying and pasting is code that I just have like snippets of like on my computers. Um, that way it's very easy for me to not have to repeat all this stuff over and over again. So. I will explain this in a second. Oh, I have to install Seaborn. Okay, so install. So Seaborn is basically a, I'm not exactly sure what it is. My understanding is it's basically like an improvement on Matplotlib that was created. So let's go ahead and install that too. And I will add that to the notes. Conda install Seaborn. Leave. That should be done. Awesome. Okay, so let's say import C born as SNS. And you'll see what we have over here is we have a beautiful matrix that shows us the correlations between the different variables. So it's basically a visualization of this table that we created over here. Uh, and as you can see, you know, we have that strong correlation between uh, longitude and latitude. And then we have the, um, uh, another interesting correlation over here, it looks like median income is quite correlated to median house value. So this is probably the most interesting row over here where we can see the correlations of um, the median house value to different numerical variables. And you can see that there's a strong correlation between the median income and the median house value, which again makes sense. If you have a higher median income or lower median income, that's probably going to drastically affect your um, uh, median house value. All right, so let us. So that is um, the basics of data visualization. There's of course a lot more that you can do, um, but you will want to run your histograms. You'll want to run your hist on the entire data set. You'll want to run your histograms on the columns you're most interested in. And then you'll want to, if you have geographic data, you'll definitely want to plot that out, um, typically using a tool like Tableau or something. Um, Tableau and Power BI, those are great tools to use. I personally uh, prefer to use those over Matplotlib. Um, and you might even want to try uh, doing a correlation matrix like this. So th these are just a couple of uh, tricks that you can use of like quick visualizations that we create in order to uh, continue, uh, in order to better understand your data. So now let's go ahead and let's work on preparing data for machine learning. All right, so let's go ahead and do what we did earlier. And we'll say housing equals strat train set dot drop median house value. Access equals one means to drop columns instead of dropping rows, which would be access zero. Housing label, so we have our we have our housing data set and our labels data set. And our labels data set will just be the median house value dot copy. Fairly simple. And there's a couple of things that we need to go over. So we need, we'll need to, um, and actually this is a good chance for me to show you guys what you get with uh, the Patreon actually. So there's this, uh, a set of notes I've created along with a more full-fledged uh, notebook than what we're going through right now where I very clearly explain all the different steps that we go through. So if we go down over here, you know, why are we splitting our data sets? Uh, I outline everything, stratified splits, what that actually means. So the definitions I'm giving you right now, uh, verbatim, or like uh, verbally, you can uh, see them in text uh, with the Patreon work. And you'll see down here, visualizing our data. You know, why is data visualization so important? A little commentary on Anscombe's quartets, histograms over here, plotting geographic data, correlation matrices, and then over here, preparing data for machine learning. So we there are four different steps that we're going to be going through. Um, feature engineering, imputation, encoding categorical variables, and scaling. Uh, not in that order necessarily, but we will be going through all of those steps. So first we want to deal with our missing values, and that is called imputation. So let's type in dealing with missing values. 
and we're going to look at our incomplete values, like what basically what rows have missing values in them. So this equals uh, housing, and we're going to filter using um, masking. So dot is null dot any, oh, whoops, dot any axis equals one, meaning, you know, again, columns. I'll make that a dot over there. Dot head, so we just see the top. So you can see we have a couple of incomplete rows over here, and it looks like they're incomplete because of the total bedrooms column over here. Um, so what we're going to want to do is that we, we will have um, multiple ways to deal with missing values. So there are three basic options we have. We can either, option one, we can either drop the rows with the missing column. So we can go sample incomplete rows dot drop na subset equals total bedrooms. And you can see what it does over here is it just gets rid of the values wherever there's, um, uh, it, it gets rid of the rows wherever we have a missing total bedroom stat. So that's one option, we can get rid of the rows. The other option is we can get rid of the columns. So we can do sample incomplete rows dot drop total bedrooms. And then we'll say access equals one again. All right. Uh, and those are two kind of just like hacky slashy ways in order to get, in order to uh, clean up our data and get rid of values that we don't, um, uh, whenever we're missing values in the middle of our data set. So you can see over here where we lost a column. But the problem is total bedrooms might actually be a tremendous measure um, to help us better understand our data and to help our machine learning model better predict our data. So let's not get rid of it. Instead, let's go ahead and do um, the option number three, which is basically imputation, which means we're going to impute a value, meaning insert a value in lieu of getting rid of these uh, values uh, entirely. So you'll see over here what we're going to do is we're going to impute, basically insert wherever there's a missing value for total bedrooms, we will insert the median of the total bedrooms. Now, depending on your data set, this is where you have to use your skills as a data scientist to figure out, okay, is like the median the best method to use or is the mean the best method to use? Uh, and we'll be going into more depth into like what, how you would actually do that in a later video. So you'll see over here, we basically replace the total bedrooms with 433, which is the median of our uh, data set over here. Oh, it's the, sorry, it's the median of uh, total bedrooms is what we have over here. So let's go ahead and let us do that. And then we want to go and just get our numerical columns. And I'll tell you guys why in a bit why we do that. So you can do that by doing housing.select d types uh, include equals np, meaning numpy, dot number, numpy, dot number. And that'll basically only keep our. Oh. And you can see we got rid of that uh, categorical column that we had. Then we're going to tell the imputer that we created, imputer.fit, housing underscore num. So you'll see what we did over here is we said from sklearn.impute, import simple imputer. And this is common. Uh, this is a common way that machine learning practitioners will like bring in sklearn stuff. They'll bring it in like piece by piece because sklearn is actually a massive package. So you want to avoid bringing in the entire thing if you can. Then what we do is we create something called an imputer object, which is basically the object that we're going to be fitting and then transforming our data with. So with almost everything in sklearn, you fit it to a data set, basically meaning that you train it on a certain data set. So this imputer will be fit onto our a housing num data set. So it's like, okay, I know to impute values and I was trained on this housing num data set. Uh, it's a little bit wonky, but like once you really think about it, it starts to make sense. 
Um, and then we need to transform our data. So we, we fit it currently. So we created a simple imputer object, strategy equals median, basically meaning it's going to uh, use the median whenever there's a missing value. And it's going to do that based on the housing num data set. So then what we want to do is we want to create a new data set called x equals imputer dot transform. Um, or you can always do fit underscore transform, and we'll be doing that in a couple of later uh, examples. Housing underscore num. And then housing underscore tr, meaning housing transformed, equals pd dot data frame of x. And then columns equals housing underscore num dot columns and then we want to keep our index too so index equals housing underscore num dot index whoops and you'll see the reason we did that is because sk learn SK learn like so you'll see x equals imputer dot transform and then when I look at like what is actually what x actually is SK learn transforms almost everything into numpy arrays uh, which we wanted to avoid this time because numpy arrays are harder to look at than uh, a clean data frame so we want to keep things in data frames as much as possible but often we will be forced to switch to numpy arrays and you can always see what strategy your imputer object uses by typing in, typing in you know, the name of your object. So in this case, we call it imputer, and we can just type in that strategy. And you can see median. All right, so the next thing we want to do is we want to encode categorical variables. Uh, and let's see. And what that means is basically um, most machine learning algorithms require um, all inputs to be in some numerical format. If you think about it, machine learning is basically just a bunch of math applied over and over and over again um, a million times. And sometimes it can get so complex that you have what you call like black box models. But uh, what happens is because we need to, um, uh, the inputs need to all be numerical in nature, we actually need to take our categorical variables. For example, in our housing data set, we had this ocean proximity data, and we need to encode that as a, um, a number of some kind. And there's a couple of ways of doing this. Um, we can do something called ordinal encoding, and I think that this computer's about to die. So I'll switch to this over here. Actually, and that'll give you guys a good view of um, how much more detail the notebook that I created for you guys on the Patreon is. But you know, I mean, you'll get to see it over here as well. So housing, or sorry, encoding categorical variables and categorical data. So there's a couple of ways we can do this. We can do something called uh, an ordinal encoder, where basically first I have to define housing cat. So basically, I'm just going to create a series of the categorical variables called housing cat. And you'll see what it does over here is that it actually just um, applies, so less than one hour to the ocean is going to be switched out with a zero. Near the ocean is going to be switched out with a four. So this is one way of um, actually uh, encoding your variables as categorical variables. And you uh, may want to do this in certain instances where one category, for example, is better than another. Um, so for example, like if... Um, you had a data set that was basically like performance, good, better, best, um, then ordinal, there, that, that is an ordinal data set where there's an actual order to it. Like good is better than, be or good is worse than better, which is worse than best. Um, but because it's not necessarily better or worse to be near the, uh, near the ocean or not near the ocean, you know, opinions aside, uh, one is not um, uh, definitely better than the other. We actually don't want to use um, an ordinal encoder. So we will be using a one hot encoder instead. So from sklearn dot, from sklearn dot uh, preprocessing, we're going to be importing one hot encoder, and then we'll call it the categorical encoder equals one hot encoder 
sparse equals false. I'll go over that in a minute. And then housing underscore cat. We'll call it one hot. And in order to make sure this video doesn't last like two hours, I'm going to be copying a lot of this code, honestly. Um, because chapter two is a doozy. It's quite long. And you'll see what it does over here is for the five categories we have, it creates a new column for every category, and it'll have a one if that category is true for that row, and a zero if that category is not true for that row. So for example, over here, uh, ocean proximity, um, it looks like that is this column over here, and that's a one because ocean proximity is true for that, and it is true for the next one too, but it's gonna be a one all the way over here for the third one near ocean. Uh, and then let me zoom in for y'all. Completely forgot about that. Uh, for the near ocean over here. And because we are doing it like this, when you do a one-hot encoding, you create a much larger data frame, but you are removing the ability for the algorithm to accidentally uh, assume that um, living near the ocean is better than living further away from the ocean. Uh, and this makes it to where that, that that doesn't actually happen. There's something called the dummy variable trap that we need to be aware of when we do one hot encoding, but we're not going to go over that right now because um, sklearn actually takes care of that by itself, and we'll come back to it in a bit. Or, well, in a future video. The next thing we're going to do is something called feature engineering. Engineering. And you can see over here that basically it's the art slash science of using domain knowledge, meaning knowledge of the specific field you're working in, in this case, real estate, um, to create new features, columns, of data using raw data. And this can be used to help improve the um, performance of machine learning models. So I'm, I created a function over here that actually creates uh, new columns. It's a little bit hard to see like this, but if I extend this and you can see we created three new columns, rooms per household, population per household, and rooms per, uh, this should be bedrooms per household. Bedrooms per household, population per household, and rooms per household. And let me correct that in this too. And we are, this is a function, so we're just gonna call the function on our housing data set. And you'll see we added three new columns to the end over here. And these columns basically have information that didn't exist before. Now, if you use some boosting algorithms, some boosting algorithms can actually do this by themselves, which is, you know, that's another level of crazy. Um, I will definitely have a video on boosting algorithms aside, Algorithms at some point in time. They are amazing. Their performance is great. Uh, they can be a little bit black boxy, which can be a problem, but, you know, that's a problem for another day. So you can see over here, we've actually created three new variables, uh, bedrooms per household, population per household, and rooms per household. And this is what feature engineering is, which is basically combining and subtracting and adding different uh, columns, features, in different um, proportions in order to get a more, in order to get a column or a feature that is a better predictor in our machine learning, uh, for our machine learning algorithms. The next thing we want to do is we want to scale our data. And I go into why this is so important. So let's go ahead and put scaling our data. Um, and basically what scaling our data means is that it means that, like, for example, if you look over here, uh, longitude and latitude goes anywhere from, like, maybe, like, negative, one, uh, negative 200 to positive, or negative 200 to negative 100, um, versus latitude is, you know, different from that. Um, and total rooms is in the thousands. Now what happens is if you try to run a couple of machine learning algorithms on this data, it'll think that, for example, total rooms is significantly more important than longitude or latitude, which it may or may not be, only because total rooms is a significantly higher number than um, longitude and latitude is. And it's for this reason that we need to scale our data. So we're just going to use the standard scaler in order to scale our data over here. So from sklearn.preprocessing, import standard scaler. Scalar equals standard scalar parentheses. Housing scaled. Um, and then we're going to use, remember how, remember how I said we'd use fit transform in the future? Well, that's what we're doing right now. We're fitting the scalar to the data, and then we're also transforming it at the same time. And we're going to be doing that to our housing feature engineered column, which I believe I created up here. Yes, I did. I created it a little bit earlier. So let's go ahead and do that. And we have our data set over there. 
And then this part is not important quite yet, and I'll tell you why. Okay, so the next thing that Garone goes over in his video is something called pipelines. And what pipelines are, are they are basically a feature built into sklearn that allows you to stack the different steps that we did one after another. So you'll see over here in this nice notebook that I have. Um, We have feature engineering, imputation, encoding categorical variables, and scaling. And there are usually more steps in pre-processing, but just for the sake of this example, this is all we had to do. Um, it'll let you stack all of these steps on top of each other one after another in order to um, easily throw data in on one end and get a result on the other end. Um, I thought pipelines were a little bit complex for what we're doing right now. So actually what I did is I created my own function which does um, the same basic thing. And we're going to copy and paste it over here. I created my own function which does the, basically the exact same thing. Uh, as you can see over here, we have our data transformations. You, Im you input data into the data transformations. Uh, and then if median house value, so basically if this column that we don't want in our training data set is there, um, then drop it. Uh, otherwise, don't drop it. And then we do our feature engineering first. And then after our feature engineering, we impute our data. And then after we impute our data, we encode the categorical data, after which we scale the numerical data, and then we concatenate all of the data. And we do all of this in order, in, in this order, um, because this is the most like optimal order for the steps that we have going on, because I wanted to keep stuff as a data frame for as long as possible. And you'll see that this is basically just a copy and paste of the steps that we performed earlier, but now it's in a nice function that I can just throw data into and get the result I want to out of it. Again, um, you know, the code is all available for you to copy, uh, copy um, if you want to over here. But of course, if you uh, join the Patreon, then you'll get this in the form of um, an actual like GitHub re repo that you can copy. So let's go ahead and start the machine learning process. We've done our data pre-processing. Now, now let's actually apply that to our data. So select and train model. All right, so let us go ahead and copy this over here. And what I did over here is I created the, the function. You'll see the function outputs an output, which is the data. It'll output the labels. Um, so you have the uh, transformed variables that we're going to use to predict our final, or predict our, our labels. You have our labels, and then you have our features. Uh, and the features will be used way later in the code, and you'll see exactly what I mean by that. Basically, that's just what are the rows of the columns. The reason I have that, though, is because um, the output and labels are a NumPy array. Uh, so let me just show you. It's this array over here, right? And I need to associate each of these individual um, kind of like columns that you see with a feature in the future. A NumPy arrays don't have features by themselves. Uh, whoops. Uh, so I need to have a list of the features that we have. So you'll see over here if I type in features, then it's a list of all the different features that we have. Remember, features is just another word for columns. And then let's go ahead and do this for our test data as well. All right. So let's go run our first uh, machine learning model. And there's always jokes about how like linear regression is not really machine learning. Um, I mean, yeah, I guess you could say it's not, um, you know, but it's the first step for everyone. It's kind of the hello world of machine learning, so. So the way you run a machine learning model in sklearn is you basically, first of all, you import, you import the correct part of the library. Come on, control C, and then like everything else, you first create a linear regression object. So linreg equals linear regression, and then lin underscore reg dot fit train data train. So basically, I'm telling the linear regression. First of all, I created the object over here. And then I'm fitting it. I'm telling it, okay, using the training data and the training labels, try and do your machine learning. Try and learn how do these labels over, or how did this data over here relate to these labels over here? That's what fitting is. How does this thing relate to that thing? And then we will transform, or then we will run our predictions. So, you know, ran it. We got our linear regression object. It's, this is a trained model now. 
meaning that it has knowledge now, and I can execute. I can go ahead and see how it compares to some of our test data. So let me go ahead and bring in the original values from our test data over here, and then our predicted values, and then comparison data frames from data frames. So you'll see the original values. I'm just bringing in the first five values from the test labels data set that we have, and then predicted values. What I'm saying is the lin reg. Uh, object, go ahead and predict, so dot predict, this test data. So um, basically taking this as an input over here, go ahead and predict something that looks like this over here, which is the median house value. So that's what we're going to do. And then we're going to compare and see how well they compare to each other. So all I'm doing over here is I'm just creating a data frame that shows how the different values compared to each other. So, I feel like I'm missing a value. Okay, no, that's it, okay. So you can see the original value for, for one of the you know predictions that we had, or for one of the uh, rows of data that we had is $500,000, that's how much the house cost. And we predicted $421,000. Not that great, we're off by about 78K. But you'll see the other predictions are not horrible. You know, we're off by about 20K, uh, 8K over here. This is obviously not, this is, probably not acceptable, uh, but again, linear regression is just your, you know, run-in-the-mill, basic, first iteration of machine learning. Let's go ahead and do something a little bit more interesting. Oh, wait, first of all, let's go ahead and run our metrics. So, we're going to bring in mean squared error. So, from sklearn.metrics, import mean squared error, lin underscore mse equals mean squared error, original values, predicted values, lin rmse, um, root mean squared error, equals the square root of the mean squared error. That's what the root mean squared error is. And you'll see our root mean squared error is about 42,587, which makes sense. Yeah, we're, you know, you'll see we're about 40K off on a lot of these predictions over here. Um, so I wouldn't call this a particularly tremendous predictor over here. So let's copy this over here. And then we have the mean absolute error, which if you remember from our uh, notes over here, mean absolute error is does not penalize large errors. And depending on what your actual algorithm or what your actual like data set is, you may or may not care about the actual, like the size of the error that much. Um, in this case, this is still way too much. So let's go ahead and use a decision tree instead. Um, this is a, an, and we'll be going into like how these algorithms actually work a little bit later. Um, but right now, I just want to show you how easy it is to iterate through different machine learning models using sklearn. So let's go ahead and you'll see it's the exact same process from sklearn.tree, import decision tree regressor. Tree reg equals decision tree regressor, uh, random state 42, that way we get the same results over and over again. So basically this is like, what seed are you using? What's the random state that the computer is going to start at? This will if I didn't have this, and it would basically give me a different result every single time. It's what you call a probabilistic model and not a deterministic model, which can be problematic for some business contexts. Some business contexts, you need to be able to get the exact same result every single time, uh, in which case you may not use this type of a model. And then basically take our tree reg object and a tree regressor object and fit it with our training data and our training labels. Look, it's the exact same thing that we did up here. And this is the beautiful thing about sklearn. Um, the syntax is the exact same regardless of which machine learning model you're using. So we went ahead and did that. And then let's go ahead and see what the actual... Huh, would you look at that? It looks like we have an error of zero. I smell something fishy. This doesn't sound correct. So now we're going to do something called cross-validation. So it seems our performance was above top-notch. An error of zero means we probably way overfit our data. Uh, meaning that we are fitting our, yeah, we probably way overfit our data, which probably means that this model is actually not quite useful at all. So what we're going to do is we're going to do something called cross-validation. Now what cross-validation does is it takes your entire training data set and it splits it into, uh, it's called um, k-fold cross-validation, sorry. So it takes your entire data set and it splits it into k different folds. So in this case, we're going to use k equals 10. And then it takes nine of those folds, and it'll make that the training data, and it'll take one fold, and it'll make that the test, or it'll make that the um, testing data. 
and it'll run the same algorithm 10 times over these different folds, different sections of the data to try and uh, uh, get you run the algorithm more often to see if it can get you a less accurate but more uh, less fitted result. And the point of this is to see are you really getting the score you want to get. So all we need to do is from model selection bring in create a cross val score and then we are going to say scores equals cross val score tree reg. That's the model we're using. And then what's your training data? What's your training label? And then what score are you going to be using? And we're going to be using negative mean squared error. Again, the scoring metric we're using is not important. I just want to show you guys how this works. And this might take a second. And then let's display all of our scores next to each other using this function over here. And you can see our error is significantly higher than what we were getting earlier. And this is why you want to do cross-validation when you can, because uh, and another good use of cross-validation is when you have too little data, cross-validation can be a good way to train your data multiple times on a small data set. That way you have more data, quote unquote, or you, ha you have more training data than you would otherwise have. Um, it's just something that you want to do to make sure that your models are actually as accurate as they say they are. Next, we're going to be using a, an ensemble method called a random force regressor. And a random force regressor is basically a bunch of decision tree regressors uh, run one after another. And it is a star model. It is a, an amazing model that works really well and gets tremendous results. And this is like true machine learning here. This is, this is kind of like this is the real stuff. So again, exact same format. It's beautiful how easy they make this. Import your regressor. We're going to be using 100 N estimators. Again, not important for now. We're going to be normalizing the random state at 42. And then we're going to be fitting it. Our forced re re regressor object, we're going to fit it on our train data and our train labels. And then this might actually take a little while. So you can see uh, random force can also take a while to run depending on how fast your computer is. Um, I don't know if a GPU acceleration would be beneficial in this case, but and then we're going to go ahead and run the same cross-validation on this. Okay, cool, cool, we got our numbers. And you can see 18,700 or 678, that is a significantly better model. So that's awesome that we, that, those are the scores that we got. And then let's go ahead and get our scores over here. And the code here is not too important. The whole point of this chapter really is to make it easy for you to understand what does a machine learning project look like overall. Um, and you can see the overall process that we're going through. Uh, plus, I don't want this video to be significantly over two hours long. And then while this is running, I'm going to show you guys something called uh, about fine-tuning a model. So now that we've run a couple of models, let's say we're going to go with the random force regressor. The results are good enough. Honestly, I would prefer something better than 18,000, but this is good enough for now. Um, what a what we do next is we might want to fine tune our model by tuning the hyperparameters. And what are hyperparameters? Hyperparameters, as I mentioned over here, are basically parameters on the model that aren't affected by training. Um, and one way to do this is doing by doing something called grid search, where grid search, if you define a certain search space, will search through every single value of a hyperparameter and insert that to your model, train it, see what it does, see what it gets. Um, until you, and then it'll tell you, okay, which one of these is the best model that you have out there. Um, in order to make sure you guys aren't waiting uh, for an incredibly long time, I'm actually just going to show you guys how it looks on the um, full workbook you get access to on the Patreon. Fine-tuning your model. Um, so you'll see over here that we're just fine-tuning our model. We, we're defining a parameter grid, um, basically what are the different combinations of hyperparameters we want to tune. And uh, we actually go into like significant depth in this in chapter four, I think, which uh, uh, hyperparameter tuning, because it's very important to tuning great models. And then after we train all of our data like that, we can get, uh, we can choose our best parameters and then our, or even our best estimator. And it'll say it's a random force regressor where the maximum number of features is six. The N estimators, remember we picked, I think, 100 last time, but it's saying, no, 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 just do 30. And then the random state is just whatever the random state is. Um, and then we go ahead and just run our um, cross-validation on using these parameters that we selected on our grid search over here. So grid search cross-validation. 
Now, one mistake or one problem you might run into with cross valid or with a grid search is that it will, because it searches every single feature in what we call the feature space, which is basically these are the hyperparameters we're going to search for. Um, it can take a long, long time, depending on you know how much computing power you have, how much data you have, um, in order to actually find what you're looking for. So you might want to do something called a randomized search, which again I detail over here. Um, and all a randomized search is is it's basically uh, the same thing as a grid search, except it's only searching random integers uh, all over the space. And you can use that to just hit some points and see, okay, like it looks like it's like over here. Let me search in this area of the grid space, or let me search in this area of the um, uh, feature space more deeply. So that's what a randomized search over here lets you do. And then feature importance. So now that we've run our randomized search, we want to, what will happen is explainable AI has become something that's very important these days. And basically what happened is um, a lot of tremendous algorithms came out, but specifically boosting models and neural networks that were tremendous predictors of um, different phenomena. And what we what happened was um, these are great predictors because they run the same algorithm like over and over again like a bunch of different times. But no, they're called black box models, basically meaning no one really knows the math behind them and how they work really deeply. Like it's very difficult to understand the math behind them because they'll do like a thousand iterations of like different formulas. Um, and this is where explainable AI becomes very important. I'm going to be doing a video in the future about something called DLIME, which is uh, stands for like a, a dis um, deterministic, linear, something, 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 but basically it's a way to like explain very complicated black box models, um, and that video will be free. Um, uh, my videos will all be free. Uh, I'm just putting some of this code on Patreon. And what we do over here is um, one way to make sure that your AI or your algorithm is, ex is as explainable as possible is we need to do, we can look at the something called feature importance. Of all the columns we have, what's the most important feature? So. Using the feature importances method under the grid search best estimator methods, we come up with a list that looks like this, and it tells us how important each feature is. And then when I link that with that features column, that features um, output from our pre-processing pipeline that we created up here, as you can see, features. I can combine it, where is it, and see that, oh, it looks like median income very much is the most important, uh, by, by a very significant margin, is the most important predictor for how the cost of housing. Uh, and then it looks like you know it being inland is quite important, but that might also just be because inland is so oversampled versus the other values. Um, longitude and latitude are quite important. That makes sense. There's probably some correlation between the longitude and latitude you live at because, you know, wealthier houses tend to congregate together, or less wealthy houses tend to congregate together. So, you know, that makes sense. And then we want to pick our final model, which will be a grid search dot best estimator. Final predictions, where we run our predictions against our test data, and then we get our final root mean squared error. Now, I would say that this isn't the best mean squared error. We could probably do better, especially if we use something like cat boost or XG boost or something like that. Um, but the whole point of this was to show you guys how a machine learning algorithm or a machine learning project works. So let's go over that. Let's start from the top and let me just go down um, from start to finish this entire thing. Uh, that way, you know, in, in case you don't want to pay for the Patreon, totally fine. You can just, you know, type out all this code over here. So we go ahead and we uh, go ahead and we bring in our data first, get our data, do a little bit of analysis, housing data info. We go ahead and look at our uh, proximity to the ocean that because that was just an interesting categorical variable we had. We go ahead and run housing data dot describe in order to get a description, a the measures of central tendency on all of our data. Income cat, that because we were told that that was an interesting uh, variable to look at. So we wanted like go look at income cat. And then we split our data into our predictors and our labels, X being our predictors, Y being our labels. Then we run sklearn.model selection, train test split, and then split our data to x train, x test, y train, y test. This is what you would normally do, but in our case, we actually decided to go with stratified splits, which will make sure that according to the income cat column we created, each of the splits that we have is has an, a representative distribution of the income cat category, or the income cat column. 
then we visualize our data and we uh, remember the importance of visualizing your data and Scrum's Quartet. We create our histograms. We plot our geographic data, our correlation matrices. This is this is a, a piece of code I, I, I recommend just saving this piece of code over here. This will like create some beautiful visualizations. People will be impressed with them uh, because um, it's not like a default visualization that just comes out of uh, a Seaborn. You have to like actually code it up. And then we prepare our data for machine learning using uh, feature engineering, um, including, and we uh, use feature engineering imputation in code categorical variables and scale our variables. And we need to deal with missing values. That's our imputation. There are three options for dealing with missing values. We can either drop the rows with the missing values, we can drop the columns with the missing values, or we can impute, meaning fill in, the missing values with some measure. In this case, we decided to use median. Encoding our categorical variables. Remember, there's an ordinal encoder, which basically will just give you a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight for each um, category that you for each category that you have. But because living inland or near the ocean, not one is not necessarily better than the other one. Even though you know you could probably argue one is, um, we cannot ordinarily categorize this, and we have to use something called one-hot encoding, which creates a new column for every category that you have and this can re, re, this can create a very large data set um, but it makes sure that you avoid accidentally creating correlations where correlations may not exist then we do some feature engineering where we basically just you know divide two columns by each other to get a new column then we scale our data remember machine learning algorithms often work poorly with unscaled data so you want to make sure you scale your data that way it doesn't place a higher importance on a um, column that just has more values in it or has higher level values in it. And then we created our pipeline, which is basically this like uh, function of data transformations where we separated our labels if they existed. We did our feature engineering, our data imputation, encoded our categorical data, scaled our numerical data, and concatenated all of our data. Selected and trained our model. So we first you know, transformed the data using the pipeline that we created. Uh, we did a linear regression, and remember, this is this is exactly how you do machine learning uh, in in um, sklearn. You create the machine learning object, uh, and then you fit that machine learning object to your training data and your training labels, and then you can run some predictions using the dot predict method, as you see over here. Then sklearn dot metrics mean squared error. You know, we just look at our metrics. We tried decision tree regressor, so we tried another machine learning algorithm over here. We found out that the decision tree regressor was actually performing worse than the linear regression once we did cross-validation, uh, which was a good way to check because we saw that we had a zero error, which makes no sense. So we ran cross-validation. And cross-validation basically splits our data set into many little chunks and then runs the algorithm on those little chunks one after another in order to get you more accurate results. Or if you have a small data set, it can uh, let you, uh, quote unquote, have more data with a smaller data set. Then we ran a random forest regressor, uh, and we found, and a random forest regressor is what you call an ensemble method, meaning it combines a, a bunch of different methods together all in one, and we found out that it actually performed quite well. So then we fine-tuned it. We did hyperparameter optimization uh, by running a grid search CV, which basically is search for all the values in a hyperparameter space that we defined. And remember, a hyperparameter is basically any parameter that is not tuned by training the model. Then, we did a randomized search, which is basically just a faster way of doing uh, a grid search by not searching every single value. Uh, and then we did our feature importance list, which basically told us that the median income was, in fact, the most important predictor for predicting the value of a property. And then we have our, we uh, predicted our final model on our test data, and we got our data set over here. So chapter two was supposed to be a quick uh, overview. Um, well, it actually, it's, it's quite long. Chapter two is very long, actually. Um, but if you go through this code that I wrote up for you, you will get the gist of what chapter two is all about. And then you can start focusing on chapter three and beyond, which are like, how do you do very specific things in uh, the machine learning world? Um, so that's all I have for you guys today. If you have any comments or questions, please leave them down in the description below. I mean, in the comments section below. Um, I really um, want to make this a more uh, viable enterprise for myself. That's kind of why I'm doing the whole Patreon thing um, because I spend um, I spent the better part of like 12 hours getting this video ready for you guys. And you know, I do that you know every single week um, and I love doing it, but um, Patreon really would help me 
make this a more viable enterprise for me to continue doing it. Plus, uh, in exchange, I am kind of trying to make, make kind of like an Amazon Prime for data science where I will continuously add value to the Patreon. So whatever you see today, like there'll be new stuff the week after and the week after and the week after. So um, if you're interested in that, please feel free to support. If not, again, all the code was fully available to you in the video uh, and you could follow along to uh, get the exact same result as possible because I do not want to withhold knowledge from anyone. Um, but thank you guys so much for your time and I hope you guys have a great day.